all very much indeed for coming along this evening for the latest of our uh, seminars in a series given by uh, Old Square Chambers. Uh, this evening's topic is contractual remedies for breach of workplace procedures. At common law, a master is not bound to hear his servant before he dismisses him. He can act unreasonably or capriciously if he so chooses, but the dismissal is valid. A pronouncement you might have expected to come from some bewhiskered judge in the 1870s rather than the 1970s. You'll recognize it, many of you, from the Malik and Aberdeen Corporation case where Lord Reed pointed up in rather graphic terms the distinction between the procedural rights enjoyed by office holders, in that case a teacher, in the earlier case of Ridge and Baldwin, a police constable, and in a very recent case, Sharon Shoesmith's case, of course, a director of childcare services. In all of those examples, enhanced procedural rights are enjoyed with public law remedies by virtue of the claimant being an office holder. But what the House of Lords in Malik was keen to stress is that that did not hold good for what they referred to as mere servants, or mere employees, whose contracts were terminable on notice and who at that stage were seen as enjoying no form of procedural right. The employment relationship was essentially viewed as transactional in character. Uh, and it's unsurprising, perhaps, that the Malik case coincided closely with the enactment of the Industrial Relations Act and the creation of the unfair dismissal remedy in the early 1970s. But it was always part of the philosophy of that statutory, re statutory regime that the remedy would be capped and that there would be a number of other restrictive jurisdictional features. It's unsurprising then that parties have sought to explore the extent to which contractual causes of action can produce a remedy for unfairly conducted employment processes. And the classic of case, of course, is the Johnson and Unisys case, where the implied term of mutual trust and confidence was relied upon by a claimant who'd suffered psychiatric illness as a result of the manner in which the dismissal process had been conducted. And he sought uh, recovery on the basis that the recently adumbrated trust and confidence term had been breached. And by a majority, the House of Lords in that case rejected his claim, and they rejected it on the basis that Parliament had developed an alternative statutory remedy, and that it would create confusion and incoherence if common law remedies were developed in an inconsistent way in parallel with that statutory regime, a point expressed by Lord Millet in the Johnson case in rather apocalyptic terms. All coherence in our employment laws would be lost if the common law recognized a more extensive right to compensation for the manner of dismissal. It was a judgment that was heavily criticized in academic circles and has been to this day. The whole idea of the contract is a uh, a relationship that is devised by the parties, why should it be assumed that their rights and remedies should be circumscribed by an intention imputed to them, that their uh, remedies should be limited by, vir by virtue of there being a parallel statutory right? Lady Hale was one of those who was most uncomfortable with the decision when she considered it in a case called Goge, she was then sitting in the Court of Appeal, and she found it odd that Goge, the claimant in that case, uh, should be able to recover damages uh, for the way in which her suspension had been conducted. But if it had resulted in a dismissal, that would be precluded by what's referred to as the Johnson exclusion area. The reason I mention her view is that her lack of uh, contentment with the Johnson decision and the Johnson approach has, I think, permeated some of the recent case law 
including the Chabra case that we're going to come on to. But her view was that the sooner Parliament comprehensively resolved these matters, the remedies available at common law uh, for breach of uh, uh, processes of this kind, the better. But her wish was not fulfilled. In the case of Edwards and Chesterfield, by a majority of four to three, the Supreme Court decided that even if a contractual disciplinary process amounted to an express term, it still would not entitle the claimant to obtain damages at large. The damages would be confined to the amount of the contractual notice period. And once again, the argument was deployed by the majority of the court that the parties could not have intended a, a remedy to exist in contract which conflicted with the statutory regime. It was a bare majority, uh, and those on the other side, and many of my colleagues were on the other side in that case in, in, in different capacities, uh, consider, perhaps with some justification, that a differently composed Supreme Court, perhaps one with the current uh, lineup of justices, might well have resolved the case in a different way. Uh, and there is some concern uh, about a lack of coherence in the way in which the uh, various members of the majority contingent uh, divided on uh, their analysis. Paradoxically, the views expressed in Johnson and in Edwards have shaped the way in which injunction remedies uh, have developed in the courts. Indeed, Lord Dyson in the Edwards case carved out the availability of preemptive remedies. He said that the ruling of the court did not impact on the extent to which injunctions might be available in a disciplinary context. And in a more recent case called Guise against Societe Generale, Lord Wilson, another of the dissenters in the Edwards case, described the injunction jurisdiction, perhaps rather pointedly, as particularly precious, specifically because of the limited financial redress which would be available in a process leading to dismissal. An increasing number of cases in this arena, injunction cases, have involved doctors. Uh, and I can tell by the glazed expression of a number of the audience that you occupy that parallel universe which is maintaining high professional standards in the modern NHS, uh, which has been a fertile uh, territory for uh, contractual disputes. One of the reasons, of course, is that the implications are so grave for uh, professional people who are dismissed uh, and face the potential impact uh, of career stigma and very significant losses, losses that are not compensated in the available damages, either in the courts or in the tribunals. One area is the uh, area of suspensions. Lord Justice Elias in Crawford went back to Lady Hale in Gogay and he deprecated knee-jerk <coughs> suspensions, an assumption that suspension was automatically justified, and expressed a concern about the taint of suspension, an assumption once an employee was suspended, that there was, uh, if you like, uh, 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 an assumption of guilt. So uh, in that case, and in several others that he's been involved in, there's been a concern about um, uh, the way in which suspension procedures are operated, and specifically that they may amount to a breach of the trust and confidence term. Can I turn to the issue of contractual incorporation? Uh, and I'll touch on it just uh, briefly. Um, the Perhaps there's been a traditional assumption that workplace policies and procedures are not readily construed as contractual documents. Often their provisions are too vague or aspirational or they're treated as being in the nature of guidance. Well, I don't think that is a safe way to proceed. The case of Bristol City Council and Deadman, I think, is a particularly telling case in this area. Lord Justice Moore Bick gave the leading judgment of the court in that case, uh, 
Uh, and he was looking at a case where there was a claim for damages, both for breach of contract uh, and for breach of a tortious duty of care. Uh, and the procedure involved was a harassment procedure which had not been observed uh, and which had been said to cause personal injuries. Lord Justice Morbick uh, talked about uh, procedures which had been implemented with the concurrence of employees' representatives, and he said that it will be a term of the contract, usually, that these procedures will be followed unless and until withdrawn by agreement. Uh, and that holds true even if the policy from which that procedure is derived is expressed to be non-contractual in terms. Uh, and the quotation from that part of the judgment is included in the written materials in your pack. A case called Hussein looked at the sort of indicia of terms and provisions in a policy that might be regarded as being apt to comprise contractual terms. But returning to Bristol City Council and Dedman, and what I think is a particularly significant part of the judgment, Lord Justice Morbick said that even if the policy is not apt to be treated as an express contractual provision, it may feed into the contract as part and parcel of the duty of trust and confidence. It may reflect the way in which the parties expect to be dealt with pursuant to that implied obligation. And therefore, it may be a relatively easy task for employees to establish that workplace procedures, unless they are wholly vague and sketchy in terms of their drafting, are intended, either express terms or by virtue of the trust and confidence term, to have contractual effect. Before handing over to Betsan, can I just touch on the issue of discretionary considerations in injunction proceedings. The adequacy of damages is always going to be a powerful consideration in injunction claims, either at the interim stage or in claims for final relief. Uh, and of course, the case of Johnson, the case of Edwards, the limited redress in unfair dismissal proceedings provides claimants, particularly professional claimants or high earning claimants, with an argument that damages will be insufficient redress. Uh, that is likely to be particularly telling at an interim application stage where cyanamide principles are applied. But another critical ingredient, and I know Lance is going to touch on it in his talk, is the issue of the preservation of a relationship of trust it used to be axiomatic that the High Court would not grant an order which would require specific performance of an employment relationship. The idea is that the court couldn't supervise the performance of that sort of order and that it was inherently unsatisfactory to place parties together in a relationship that had become dysfunctional. Now, that principle has become less absolute over time. In the context of disciplinary proceedings, for example, an employee may often be suspended or working as in the case of Maisie and St. George's Hospital on restricted duties. There may be ways in which, as it were, the ring can be held during the currency of a finite process. Or it may be in other respects that the contract remains workable up until a point in time when a final determination can be made. So to what extent does that discretionary consideration act as a barrier to the grant of injunctive or declaratory relief? 